Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear us very well. Uh, maybe we can put uh, the slide on the screen, please. Yeah, thank you. So um, maybe we can wait. Uh, what do you think, uh, the organizer? Do we wait like uh, one or two minutes? Or can we start right now? OK, we can start. OK, so um, once again, good morning. This panel is about a lot of very important topics, human rights, participation, equal access, and civil society. These are also key issues uh, as conversation on NI governance are moving forward and new regulation tools are currently drafted. In this panel, we will try to make sense with all of this issue and we will try to make a strong demonstration and advocacy on the importance of linking them tightly together. We will try also to demonstrate why protection of human rights, the rights of affected people have to be embedded into participatory and accountable processes of AI regulation. And uh, what we are going to present today uh, are the first outcome of a research material that we have been working on for more than one year. My name is Karine Gentelet. I am Associate Professor of Social Science and holder of the chair uh, on social justice and AI. Uh, this chair is funded by Abeona Foundation, Ecole Normale Supérieure and Obvia. And now I will give the floor to my colleague uh, Anna Rorca and Francesca Fanucci to introduce them. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Karine. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm in Poland, so for me, it's good afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Anna Rurka. I'm the um, past president of the Conference of the International Non-Governmental Organization of the Council of Europe and also the senior lecturer in science of education in Paris Ontario University. So very happy to, to join this conversation. Thank you very much for inviting me. Francesca. Thank you. Merci, Karin. Uh, I am Francesca Fanucci, an Italian in London, I'm senior legal advisor to the European Centre for Not for Profit Law, ECNL. Uh, I'm also fellow of the Centre for Media and Society, Data Media and Society of the Central European University. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to the debate here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. To you both, Sarit. Sarit, we can't hear you. Unmute your mic. Of course, I apologize. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here uh, today. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Sarit Mizrahi. I am a researcher at the Abiona ENS Obvia Chair with uh, Karin. And I'm also a PhD candidate in law at the University of Ottawa. Um, now, in, uh, in our presentation today, Kevin and I will begin by uh, drawing on our current research to provide a bit of background on the importance of civic participation towards ensuring equal access to AI governance. And we'll, we'll then give the floor to uh, Francesca and Anna, who will elaborate on the subject based on their experiences as members of civil society advocating for human rights and AI governance. I'll begin by offering an overview of the tools that have so far been favored uh, for extending human rights protection in the AI context, outlining the challenges they pose and why an approach grounded in civil participation ought to be prioritized in order to ensure that human rights acts as an overarching framework for AI governance. And I will proceed by presenting the conditions of an effective societal participation in order to allow people to engage on issues that matter to them and within a frame that would make sense, sense sorry, to their living realities. Uh, so the protection of human rights uh, in the AI context has received much attention in recent years. Three tools are generally favored towards achieving this feat. The first is ethical frameworks. These advance a certain set of values that ought to be respected in the development and deployment of AI systems, such as human dignity, uh, dignity equity, uh, non-discrimination, justice, and so on. The second is algorithmic impact assessments, which is a governance practice that seeks to increase accountability by rendering visible the harms propagated by AI systems and ensuring that practical, practical steps are taken to uh, rectify those harms. Uh, 
It's basically a questionnaire, the answers to which make it possible to determine the impact level of a particular algorithm. And lastly, we have regulatory frameworks. These tend to come in either one of two forms. Uh, the first is risk-based regulations, which assess the scope of risk associated with various uses of AI systems, and then subject these technologies technologies to obligations that are proportional to their potential threats. And the second is rights-based regulations, which effectively create specific rights for citizens uh, and impose a list of obligations in order to ensure that those rights are respected. Um, although they do cover a lot of ground, none of these solutions are truly effective at empowering citizens because they don't position human rights as an overarching legitimizing framework. While they may be informed by human rights, they're not quite grounded in them. Uh, for their part, ethical frameworks are difficult to implement. They're adopted to save face, but have little concrete effect. And this is for many reasons. First off, ethical principles vary across the spectrum. While some like transparency, fairness, and explainability tend to recur, context and culture often play a large role in defining ethical standards and current approaches fail to account for such elements. Moreover, ethical frameworks are self-regulatory. They're voluntary codes of conduct that lack the necessary enforcement mechanisms to ensure accountability for human rights violations. Often referred to by critics as mere ethics washing, this approach does little more than delay the development of concrete human rights protections in the AI context. Although algorithmic impact assessments seem more proactive than uh, ethical frameworks in that they seek to assess and address algorithmic harms prior to deployment, they're similarly ineffective at advancing human rights because they define harms in terms of in impacts, but oftentimes the impacts identified don't correlate to the lived experiences of those affected. And this disparity exists uh, because the groups and communities concerned aren't consulted throughout the processes in which these tools are developed. They, their protection of human rights is therefore purely superficial and will remain so in the absence of effective citizen participation. And regulatory frameworks suffer from a similar pitfall. Uh, Risk-based approaches are, for their part, anchored in inequality. They permit AI systems to be deployed as long as their operational risks to human rights are low. But low risk doesn't mean no risk. In neglecting to account for situations where risks are low for some but high for others, this approach characterizes a certain measure of human rights violations as acceptable. And as such, they, the very fact that a human right has been infringed doesn't necessarily entitle citizens to redress. Rather, it's only when a particular high risk materializes that accountability becomes more likely under such a regulatory mechanism. Uh, but even rights-based laws aren't free of such drawbacks. They advance a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't adequately account for societal challenges, making it difficult for many citizens to mobilize the solutions favored. Take, for instance, the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR for short. It grants citizens rights over their personal data to protect them against misuse. Uh, we're probably all familiar by now with uh, the, the uh, pop-ups appearing on websites that request permission to use our personal information. Uh, this is a direct result of the GDPR. But most people quite simply click accept without taking any additional steps to manage that data. Um, such that this aspect of the GDPR hasn't quite had its desired effect. And the reason is because the solution adopted was developed through processes that lacked effective citizen participation, that didn't consult with those affected by the law in order to determine how it could best serve them. And on that note, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Kevin, who will elaborate more on the conditions of an effective participation uh, in order to prioritize human rights as an overarching framework in AI governance. Kevin. Thank you, Sarit. So now that we have talked about, you know, the different models of regulation and before digging into the perspective of civil society, I would like to take a few minutes to highlight what are the conditions or the BDS, as my kids say, behind the scene of participation. If we want to put in place effective protection tools of human rights, we need to consider four elements in order to design it. I have called it the four corner of the one million coin. Maybe you can slay in the chat. Yeah. 
Uh, the first one is social justice. Uh, consider challenges uh, on the social fabric as well as the collective responsibility uh, mechanism. The second is bottom-up approach, inclusion from a fieldwork perspective, lived experience of affective people and groups. The third one is autonomy, individual and groups, mostly groups should be able to act on their needs and identify violations to their rights. And the fourth one is direct access to courts that those affected can seek to redress for the harm suffered. The next slide, please. Once these bases are in place and in order to offer an effective uh, participation, meaning people can define their rights and find the solution to address their needs, there will be uh, a need to consider a process supporting three stages. The first one is deconstruct, structural mechanism of exclusion, where there is also a need to deconstruct social and political context, as well as socioeconomic determinants. Also, what we need to be deconstruct is the intersection between profiles and rights. That means that no one-fits-all um, approach. Also, a need to deconstruct the te technological, this one is complicated to say for a francophone, technological universalism and also the primacy of the expert world. Uh, what I want also to highlight in that uh, deconstruct face is uh, the relationship between the individual and the collective as concept. In most of the work I've been reading or the regulation document I've consulted or the conference I've attended to, I heard some experts talking about individual rights, but what we have here are collective impact, large collective impact. We also have large discrimination mechanism. So we can talk about some of individual, but shift the conversation and regulation tool on the collective and societal dimension of impact. This means that accountability processes can be powered by individual action, but at a societal level. This is a matter of democracy. Participation should be designed to engage with society, institution, and not individuals. This leads us to the second phase of the process, reinforce capabilities. It means educating about human rights, social, economical, cultural, but also link this human right to digital rights and permitting people impacted to describe the arms, a process post as opposed to ante, and working with civil society and community-based organization. Finally, the last stages, mobilize. Talk to people with where they understand and topics that matters to them. We need to engage with people about justice, talk about human rights rather than about technology or even risk. Facilitate the connection between rights and violation. It means direct access to courts. Include live experience at the core of the procedures. Design realistic approach for access to courts. And finally, use existing democratic mechanism of governance and accountability. And for the conclusion, as my, for my last slide, uh, as a conclusion, I would like once again to highlight that issue of participation, but also, you know, equal access, governance of AI and protection of human rights are not issue related to AI technology. That we have to empower citizens by giving them the means to act and recognize the experience of those affected and their ability to describe their arms. We also need to empower their representative and include civil society and finally design an accessible, an accessible uh, collaborative and flexible accountability processes. This is uh, the end of, of our presentation. And now I will uh, uh, give the floor to my colleague, Anna and Francesca. We have agreed uh, that Sarit and I will ask them some question. And after uh, the series of question uh, to Anna and Francesca specifically, we could open the floor to the question uh, uh, from the audience. So to begin, uh, Anna and Francesca, I have a first question for you both. Uh, could you describe shortly your experience at the intersection between human rights and AI. Who want to start? Francesca? Okay, Is yeah, it? that's fine. Thank you, Anna. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to explain that, and for those 
in the audience that may not know about uh, the European Centre for Not-for-Profit Law, that our mission is to promote a legal and policy framework that protects and expands civic space. And what do we mean by civic space? We mean an environment where individuals as well as groups and society can meaningfully exercise their freedom of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly, freedom of association, and last, and last but not least, their right to participation in public decision making. And now the lawyer in me springs up and says that essentially it's not an abstract concept, but uh, it's a, a, or simply an ethical principle. It is a right enshrined in Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And even the Human Rights, the Office of the High Commissioner, have elaborated guidelines in this sense to help member states implement this right effectively. Having said that, though, where does AI get into the, the intersection in the equation? Essentially, we advocate for the uh, inclusion, the proper uh, streamlining of uh, human rights safeguards and not just ethical principles in the development and functioning of digital technologies, including artificial intelligence driven technologies. And this has to happen throughout their entire life cycle. And in order to do this more specifically, what we ask from regulators or policymakers is to uh, mandate human rights impact assessment on a technologically based system. Now, before, whenever we say this, that there is an initial gasp of scare, oh, you're going to stifle the innovation, so you're going to put a lot of burden on users and providers, so what's this human rights impact assessment all about? As a matter of fact, we do not envisage at all a one-size-fits-all mandatory impact assessment it's because we do acknowledge that different contexts, different situations, different technologies themselves may entail different risk levels and therefore uh, we can adapt these assessments to the different contexts. What we do think is not non-negotiable, though, and applies to all sorts of assessment, is participation of relevant stakeholders, multi-stakeholder approach. We believe in particular, in our case, that relevant civil society organizations, but also representatives from the commonly marginalized and vulnerable groups, should have a place at the table because they may not be tech experts, but they are right holders. They are human rights experts in their own right, excuse the pun. And therefore, they have to be granted a level of engagement in the process. Where we do, from our experience, uh, find challenges, it's not, you know, uh, interestingly enough, one may think that we need to push for states or for industry to include uh, civil society. And that, of course, is part of the, of the task. But we find, uh, initially to our surprise, uh, we found that even after encouraging or facilitating a platform for civil society organizations to engage with uh, the other stakeholders, several organizations or several activists, several human rights holders, almost censor themselves, are intimidated. They do not want to engage because the narrative is not in their favor. As you mentioned before, Karin, we talk about tech, we don't talk about human rights. We talk about artificial intelligence, which in itself is a definition that technical experts themselves would frown upon because there is still no agreement on what artificial intelligence means, for example. At the same time, it's a, catch it's a catchy phrase. You talk about artificial intelligence, you get the attention because the first thing that one thinks of is the future, the robots that will govern the world, uh, intelligent entities more intelligent than humans that will help us save the world, etc., etc. But in reality, we are talking about a spectrum of technology that to a different extent 
is driven, you know, it makes its uh, functioning in an autonomous way. But we're talking about essentially algorithm driven processes. In some cases, it can be machine learning, deep learning, and therefore proper technical artificial intelligence. In some other cases, it is not. But ultimately, the people do not understand or are not sure what we are talking about. So the first step would also be to simplify the language and try to make it more straightforward and encourage people to understand that they own the process as much as the industry, the academia and policymakers. But here I would like to stop for the moment and probably hear from Anna what she has to say, because incidentally, we as ECNL also try, whenever it's not possible to already engage these organizations in the international arena, we uh, participate on their behalf. And so we um, were appointed by the Conference of International NGO, the organization that Anna Ruka presided over, uh, as a representative of NGOs at the Council of Europe Committee on Artificial Intelligence. Maybe I can talk about it later if there is time or if there are questions, but I would be keen to, to hear from Anna about this. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, uh, yeah, so so maybe firstly, I, 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 I can explain the place from where I, I, I speak uh, in some words. So um, the Conference of the International Non-Governmental Organization is the body of the Council of Europe. And and it is also important to say that in, in the intergovernmental um, uh, landscape, uh, you don't have really the intergovernmental institution apart of the Council of Europe where we can find the body um, inside of the organization composed by the civil society. And um, so uh, currently there is 300 international NGOs who have the participatory status with the Council of Europe and which found this collective uh, body uh, um, of civil society. So I, I had a, a honor during six years uh, to be the president of, of, of this conference. Um, I finished my mandate last year. And, um, and and our challenges, it was clear, but uh, as an experience, it's important that uh, artificial intelligence as a topic was imposed to us by the Council of Europe. It means that it was on the agenda of the Council of Europe. And I'm not sure today if I can say that without this obligation to elaborate, to consult, to mobilize, to advocate, uh, for this framework, if the conference of INGOs by itself will have an interest to, to work on. And, and this is also the result for me of the interest and also about the knowledge that civil society can have um, in the topic, uh, saying that these INGOs are not tech. This is the international NGOs, which we have the really the wide um, interest. We have the human rights defenders, of course, but also the teachers, the social workers, uh, the religious group. So, 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 so this was important to say uh, at that uh, at that time, and that's why we 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 work very very closely, not only on this topic with ECNL, uh, because ECNL is one of the rare organization uh, who has this common um, and I say wide uh, spectrum from civil society and from a very specific farm, not only law, but also tech expertise. So uh, we were, we the, the topic from international, uh, artificial intelligence came from the Council of Europe agenda. Uh, and after then we start to reflect because of course that what is also important to say that, and I, I would like to make a link what Karin said, uh, as a body, we were, uh, inform about the so-called violation of human rights before even that the case go to the court. So the INGOs, the civil society, um, uh, contacted this conference of INGOs saying, this is this this happened now in this country, okay? Uh, but we also, um, so, so we had this, um, what I can say, uh, it, it wasn't not mechanism, but just they want to inform us that some there is some kind of violation of human rights uh, without even understand that it can be 
linked to the use of the artificial intelligence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, it obliged us to 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 really analyze the issue and the problem that the civil society came with with that, saying that it may be uh, relevant to look on uh, on the use of algorithm uh, in this case, in this specific case, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, as a conference, we we had this this guidance role for civil society, but also not only international, but also the grassroots organization. This is important uh, because the grassroots organization, very often they are the citizen, very local one, uh, who, um, uh, who, 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 who simply don't aware or don't have acknowledged capacity to really see what is the problem what is the origin of the problem uh, that they meet uh, and and they face the consequences of the problem so um so so this is where the fan this is this the space between human rights and artificial intelligence in my experience that that oblige us to to be uh, to build our capacity with cnl but other organization as well to be more aware as a body of what we can do um, to bring civil society perspective in this intergovernmental decision making process i think that you have another question so i i stop here uh, so, yeah, next question. As representatives of civil society organizations, why do you see participation in AI governance as a pillar of human rights? Okay, if I can uh, answer this one. Uh, well, luckily for me, it's not me that answers or has to justify this directly, although I truly believe that it is a pillar. But you see, uh, less than a year ago, in July 2021, the uh, Human Rights Council of the United Nations adopted a resolution by consensus, no less, in times where a famous representative was still a member, incidentally. Uh, but nevertheless, um, this resolution is titled, uh, the imp uh, is dedicated to the impact of new and emerging technologies on human rights. And for those who may want to look it up, it's uh, 4712, is the number. Now, in this resolution, the Human Rights Council specifically uh, acknowledges that uh, the approach to uh, new and emerging technology is based on three pillars. One is uh, the uh, holistic human rights approach that is necessary to take. One is a we need a holistic understanding of the technology. But the third pillar is acknowledged in the governance. We need a holistic governance and regulatory efforts. And uh, this is uh, 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 this was um, the three pillars were uh, outlined by a supporting study of the Human Rights Council Advisory Committee. The actual resolution in its final uh, uh, text uh, establishes that there is a need for all stakeholders to collaborate in a more concerting way, addressing the possible impacts, opportunities and challenges of new technologies with regard to human rights. So the Human Rights Council itself uh, recognizes that uh, a concerted multi-stakeholder approach is necessary uh, and is the way to go, both for regulatory efforts, both for understanding, we need to promote mutual understanding, and also, so it's important to highlight that governance, you know, multi-stakeholder participatory, meaningful governance helps not only civil society, it also helps, for example, the tech industry or the tech experts, the developers understand the problems that they are facing, which is why I always have this be in my bonnet of uh, trying to rebalance the debate towards human rights, whereas I can hear a lot of still a lot of debate on ethics. There is no binary trade off. There is no dichotomy between ethics and human rights, but we need to understand the relationship between the two, because more often than not, I hear the argument of ethics as a replacement of human rights. 
ethics and ethical principles are crucial and necessary to inform and interpret and adapt the scope of human rights based on the society that we live in, based on the challenges that we face all the time, based on the new and emerging technologies that we are dealing with. But the ethics does not replace the human rights framework that exists and that entails specific obligations. So this is why I believe that, that this also explains why governance and participatory governance is crucial because we are talking about the rights of the people and what they can do and what they can enjoy and not necessarily to face the negative impact of technology but also to reap the benefits of these technologies that these technologies can offer. I have just a question for you and, and maybe Anna can rebond on that uh, about uh, uh, the um, because what, what you were saying, in fact, uh, be between ethics and human rights, you know, ethics is non-binding. So this is probably the issue and there is no, you know, you can design your own accountability and there is no uh, accountability uh, processes that make consensus. And uh, so it could be maybe some 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 issue between ethics and, and uh, when I just came back, because I'm a sociologist trained in, in social science and I was, uh, I, I I'm still always amazed to see how ethics are, you know, used to to say, okay, this is what we we are going to do. Uh, it's your own issue, ethics. It's not the issue of, of society. So you have to to give other tools to make sure that people uh, can protect their own rights. This is the first uh, I wanted to say. And also, uh, Francesca, you were mentioning about human rights impact assessment, but we have one in Canada. And it's not binding. And basically, this is you have like a website and you check boxes to make sure that there is no nothing more to, to make sure that you don't violate any kind of basic human right. So uh, uh, do you uh, do you uh, talk about that in your discussion? And also, um, so this is the first question flew to you and maybe for Anna too, but also about uh, when you say that uh, we have to... Um, um, define what kind of human rights. What I've seen when I was talking to people, especially affected people, but also in the literature, is that, you know, there is the impact that we know now, but as um, there is many much uh, uh, AIs, technologies that have been deployed in society, so there is probably other impact that we will discover once, you know, the technology is deployed more largely. So what what are we going to do with that kind of, of impact as they are not, you know, defined in the law or in the ethics or guidelines or what, what and, and we anticipated that with anticipating, sorry, that the impact are going to be uh, very, uh, very uh, um, hard on, on societies and, and especially marginalized groups. So what, what, what can we do with that? Okay, very briefly, yes, I agree that ethics more often than not is used, to, is preferred in the concept because uh, it entails uh, non-binding uh, or self-regulatory, self-imposed uh, constraints. But uh, like I said, I don't want to promote the idea and this understanding that ethics uh, goes against human rights. That's exactly the opposite. Ethics uh, informs. The reason why I say ethics uh, is crucial and instrumental to the definition of human rights, because at some point of the regulatory debate, and particularly at the beginning of the Council of Europe uh, discussion, for example, there was a question whether we uh, needed to create new human rights to be able to uh, cope with these uh, fast evolving technological developments. And uh, I have to say, in some cases, probably the jury is still out, but the conclusion that we reached within uh, the forum of the Council of Europe was that, no, we don't need new rights. We need to adapt, uh, the expl explain, adapt, tailor the, new, the, the existing rights and regulatory framework to the emerging technologies. Obviously, when the treaties, just to be brutally plain, when the treaties, the human rights treaties were negotiated the existing ones and approved the online world that we have at our disposal now was not out there we didn't even conceive it probably and therefore 
we had the, the first step that we had to take, for instance, and regulatory level recently was to acknowledge that the same rights that we have offline are protected online, which sounds like common sense, but it took ages to even gain awareness of this space. For instance, we as ECNL took part in the uh, drafting, we, we assisted the Human Rights Committee of the UN in the drafting of general comment on uh, Article 21 of the ICCPR, on freedom of peaceful assembly, the right of peaceful assembly. That document that is an authoritative interpretative document of the right to peaceful assembly acknowledges that the right to peaceful assembly exists in the online world or in a combination in hybrid with the offline online world. And this was unheard of, you know, to, to think of all the implication that this entails from, in, even in terms of state's obligation to facilitate this right. So in other words, we have the bulk of rights. We need to clarify them to the changing world. And in order to do so, we do face ethical challenges, new ethical challenges. So we need ethics to help us in this effort. But ethics must not replace the legally binding framework and that is given by the human rights. We can improve the, 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 the scope of human rights, but we cannot replace them. Anna, do you want to jump on the... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I of, of course agree, um, but I, I think that there is in this public, uh, not only today here, but uh, in general, there is a confusion between ethics and law. Uh, um, the ethical dilemma, it's, uh, the ethics is about the value principle and it's have also some moral dimension. Um, and and in Council of Europe, for example, um, they, they speak about the bioethics because there is a the question which are bioethical, uh, and of course um, it, it's more about the guidelines, etc., et et but but not about the law. So I, I also agree that it is complementary, uh, but but very often even if you have a law. The professionals can have an ethical dilemma, um, so the law will not prevent uh, to have an ethical dilemma, etc. But uh, I, I think that in this discussion there is um, a clear, um, a, a clear dilemma, <laughs> uh, saying that do we need a new, new legal instrument for the new issues artificial intelligence but also environment or or another global um, uh, case um, topics um, or if we uh, pre it is preferably to to develop the case law uh, on the base of the existing legal document, I speak about the Convention on Human Rights, but also I think that at the UN level, the Convention, yeah, um, because if 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 there is um, if, if, if the new Convention, the, the the kitchen of that, when you, when intergovernmental organization elaborate a new Convention, it take it it takes the year. Uh, firstly, to elaborate, to write, and after to ratify. To so I, I, I'm not sure that we have at this time to uh, to elaborate a new um, uh, legal instrument, or we should uh, more think about the additional protocols, or or even the new um, the new uh, case law, the interpretation of the case law. Uh, on, on the base of the existing document, because we really don't have a time. The artificial intelligence, you, the use is already here. If we look on the climate issue, we are already in as well. So we need the regulation now, right now, not in five or 10 years. Uh, uh, and, and after then, the new legal instrument will, will also take a time to uh, to, to, for the ratification, it will be the discussion between the government. So, so I, I, I'm not sure that we have this time. Um, so, so this is one of the questions. I, I, I think that the choice should be made. I don't know what is the good answer to that, but what I know is that we need the regulation, human rights regulation, and and tech regulation. That. Um, and secondly, I would like to also say that um, we need to re also replace this um, this uh, 
this discussion in the framework of the participatory democracy uh, because uh, at, and not only human rights but democracy as well because when Francesca is saying that civil society should uh, we need to have the participatory approach to to to, to AI. Uh, it is because, not because it's AI, be, be, but because it's a democracy. Uh, and, um, and and clearly the participation is the learning process. And from civil society, it is also the learning process about in this multi-stakeholders um, fora, what are the interests of every kind of stakeholder, but also what is AI as well. Uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, so, so I think that there is a, a, lot, a lot of dimension, but I would like to just mention that it is about democracy and human rights and rule of all law, because we spoke speak about the, the law uh, and not only some something specific about the AI. Um, Karin, if I may quickly chip in, because I realized I owe you uh, part of the reply on the issue of human rights impact assessment. You mentioned the Canadian example. Yeah. Um, let me tell you that recently, as you may have heard, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, for example, the parliament voted a motion uh, calling on the government to approve uh, legislation to introduce mandatory human rights impact assessment on AI systems that are used by public authorities or on behalf of public authorities. So this element of the obligation, which obviously, if approved shortly, would anticipate, preempt uh, the approval of the AI Act at EU level, at least you know, as far as the Netherlands is concerned. But um, the thing is that, once again, we don't know. Um, it's true that we don't know what the best we, we 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 are still at the level of fighting to have this human rights impact assessment there are models that are being piloted that are being tested but we don't know yet what they will look like because for instance in europe the only precedent that we have is the data protection impact assessment and again of the gdpr and we uh, uh once again you know it, it only deals with one right as you said, we talk about holistic approach of human rights and how do we conduct a, a holistic human rights impact assessment? We have to try it on the ground as well. But one thing is certain, we cannot do this without the participation of the relevant actors involved, which leads back to the participatory model. Exactly. And and uh, it leads to my next question and it... it um... The question is in line with a question from the audience, because uh, there, we have a question in the audience uh, saying, how can citizen and civil society organization uh, take back power from tech firms uh, to change uh, the power inequality? And and uh, the reason why I'm, I'm reading this question is is uh, the following uh, uh, sentence. It's citizen unfair, often feel like they won't have much of a say. And this is an issue exactly that we hear often and, and we hear that from the past 10 years. So um, I, I ask you, how can we, what kind of mechanism, processes uh, would, should be put in place to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we address uh, the um, equal access yeah. and, and civil society participation? Hmm. Is participatory the only uh, solution? I can uh, start if Francesca allow me. Um, um, yeah, I, I think that what we already say a little today, I think that the model should be designed um, on the basis of several stages. It means that we need to act uh, on the several levels at the same time. Firstly, uh, that we, it means that um, uh, the people who are aware, who are engaged, but even more the policymakers and the people who are in in, in charge of the issue um, to uh, the first level it's really to ri raise awareness about the about the AI in society in the schools uh, with the children with the vulnerable people and it can come really by the very ordinary way uh, you know um, and I, I, I remember uh, Fran we, we discussed one one day about that with Francesca make some the national day of 
the uh, artificial intelligence or something like this, you know, to make the, the, the events about that, not only for academia, not only for experts, but really on the ordinary life of the people. Secondly, uh, so this is the first, uh, first stage. And after then, uh, I think that there is, um, it is because AI, it's really like the transversal issue for our ordinary life and our institutions. So after the second, it's more institutional level and 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 participation is a means, but it, it's not the finality for me. The finality, it's really the co-management. We need to have the 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 body, the co-management body. Uh, including this multi-stakeholder perspective and people in the institution who are who use which use the artificial intelligence in the decision making process and in 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 the in the they uh, in in, in the, the 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 way that they deliver the services yeah uh, and we need to have this co-management body uh, including citizen yeah, uh, it should be something transparent, accountable, and all principle for democracy as well. Uh, uh, and for me, it's the, like the intermediary body. Yeah, because th this is about the institutions. Um, and and the, 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 the third level, it is really the uh, decision making process, political decision making process as well. Uh, and it should also be based on the co management. And really, I'm not, you know, fine. Uh, the pandemic, for example, in France, I can say we were dominated by the medical staff. Oh, I, I remember that the government have a council, but mostly composed by the by the medical staff uh, and the pandemic don't have the effect only on it's not only medical it's so so sorry it's, it's all society who is impacted and only after they open this council to the organization which really are uh, focused on the marginal mar for vulnerable people but it is the example that we need to think the the the, the management the governance um in this uh, democratic governments starting the beginning with this multi stakeholders and co-management um, dimension uh, and really uh, acting on, on several levels at the same time. Thank you. Um, perhaps if I can briefly add to this that it depends uh, um, what type you see. There's not a single answer. First of all, Yes, I mean, the participatory process uh, is, uh, whether it is imperfect or not, but is uh, uh, necessary. Uh, the, the level of involvement has to exist, but it very much depends. I mean, I'm thinking of the reply to the questions, how can uh, citizens, uh, you know, take back the power from... They need to be involved uh, in all different levels of uh, the debate. So, for instance, member states, uh, I mean, states, governments uh, decide to uh, adopt uh, or to elaborate a strategy on AI, a national strategy, which means that they decide whether they need rules, if and how much they are going to invest, how they are going to deploy these technologies. So citizens have to be involved in that debate as well. There's not only, the, the, there are different ways, entry points. If a state is approving a legislation, if a council at local level decides to use an AI tool, for example, to, this, to uh, uh, speed up the admin process, or if the judiciary decides to use an AI tool, everything has to be done in transparently and has to involve citizens. But, how do you consult? And the same when a law is approved, etc. But how do you consult? It's not enough in some cases to just issue, for example, an online questionnaire. Or I talked to industry that in perfect good faith, when they release a product or they are about to research in a product, identify relevant stakeholders and send out questions. And they uh, come to us and say, but, you know, we did it. And they, no one replied because they didn't have capacity or because they didn't understand. So you also have to adapt. You have to be flexible and creative in the way you approach the different stakeholders. And um, ultimately, 
this has to become the rule by default, not just uh, a favor or uh, uh, some kind of uh, you know privilege that is uh, granted. And another thing that I allow me to to, to underline is that an aspect of consultation or of participation that is often neglected is the follow-up to the consultation. You have consulted whichever way, you know, survey, focus groups, uh, conferences, whatever. You gather the information, you go and do your assessment, your law, whatever. But then the in the final results, or you write your report, no one understands the process of elaboration of that information gather, how it made it into the final cut or not, what balancing exercise was made between uh, all, you know, all the different positions received. People, in order to trust consultations and participate, engage in consultations, also have to understand what happens to their information, why it is retained, why it is not retained, and how. And what, what you are saying is very, very interesting from a sociological point of view, because uh, about participation and the fact that, you know, you don't know about the results, the outcome, and et cetera, the methodology. This is exactly, precisely what uh, indigenous people from Canada, the first people from Canada, were mentioning for the past 20 years. And this is why they put in place research protocol, for example, to make sure that, you know, when they participate, when they collaborate with researchers in social science, they want to, um, they want to be sure that, you know, they are uh, um, keeping the loop and, and they are true partners. So this is not an issue. It's why I was mentioning this is not an issue of AI or technology. This is an issue of, you know, social uh, inclusivity or social uh, democracy. I don't know how the, the exact word I should put on. And also uh, maybe to, to give the floor to Sarit because she has another question for you. Um, because I saw a comment on the chat or question. You don't need to... You don't need to know technology to talk about technology as as long as it impacts your rights, because you know what you know, you know exactly you're an expert on the, the impact it has on you, uh, depending what kind of technology it is. So I think this is also one thing that we need to keep in mind as society, make sure that we are expert of an our uh, reality. So sorry. Um, so this uh, question is uh, from the audience and sort of in line with what uh, Karine was just saying and also with what Anna mentioned earlier about the importance of education. Um, so this participant says citizens may also feel disempowered because they don't feel like they know enough about AI systems. How can we educate the general public about how these systems work and uh, how it may harm them? And uh, one aspect that uh, Anna was mentioning earlier is the importance of educating children from a young age. Um, and I'll note that there are a, a lot of, you know, robotics and programming pr um, and AI programs that are coming out in, uh, in like elementary schools these days, but not enough of uh, an emphasis on, um, on the, you know, ethical uh, aspect. Um, and uh, so what do you think, uh, how can we better educate the general public, whether it's from a young age or, or you know, later on in life? Uh, what's your take on, on this question? I can start. I think that um, we need also to change the narrative because very often we sp speak about the risk assessment, risk-based approach, but maybe we need to as well, in this similar way, to speak about the capacity, citizen capacity-based approach. Uh, uh, and, and think how we can empower a citizen to, 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 to really, uh, uh, you take a power, uh, clearly, uh, um, and the power should be shared. In democracy, it's like this, clearly. Uh, so, um, so I, I think that we need to, we need to really think about this capacity, capacity building, but also capacity-based approach um as well and 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 uh regarding the the yeah the, the the curricula in the school but also uh when we spoke about the equal uh, access we have the very specific profession like uh, teachers but also social workers um uh, who uh who are maybe more exposed to deal with uh, uh and to work with the citizen 
who can be impacted by uh, by the different kind and the new kind of discrimination uh, that uh, um, AI uh, leads to. So, um, so I think this capacity-based approach is as well we need to reflect and build on as well, and not only to to assess the risk but also the capacity. Yeah? Um, I just think all I need to add is that, yes, of course, uh, uh, education is paramount from a young age in the schools, but um, we need to have a, a short-term uh, view and a long-term view. The long-term view, of course, is to prepare the ground for the new generations to be digitally literate, which they already are in a certain sense, you know, that they are children that, you know, my own son learned how to swipe on the iPhone before I learned and can deal with the TV better than I do. Uh, but what I'm saying is that the short term approach is for those people that for whatever reason are cut off from technologies or they don't have the means that the age or, or even the ability, the mental ability to approach. They have to be empowered with concrete rights and with safeguards that go beyond the education. They have to be provided proactively with information about what technology are being used to deal with their rights, for instance. And it may sound like what, but not only when I, already when I say they need to be told what technology I'm using uh, too sophisticated the language, they need to be taught that there is a such thing in the world that is called the data. And what is data is your name, surname, your age, what you do. And what does this mean? Where does this go? Who keeps it? Who gets it? How long does it stay? What happens when I go to the airport and an image scans me and checks with my passport? Is this facial recognition? Really? No. Why? Is this AI facial recognition? And then again, you, you go towards the most sophisticated. But we really need to rethink the entire approach for that. And, and I do hear again the argument we need to, to, breach, to breach the digital divide absolutely fine but this is not something that is going to work in the short term or that is going to work for some people or some countries or some areas so we need to be conscious that something needs to be done now and probably to the point where we do know that is going to impact the, the 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 fruition of these technologies but it does not necessarily have to use the technological language I think we still have like two minutes, so maybe uh, there is no question from the audience. Ladies, we will have, uh, uh, in fact, for the, the four of us. Um, I want, just want to make quickly, shortly uh, talk about, you know, the linking between uh, human rights and digital rights. Because what I see is, you know, it's like a dichotomy. We have uh, on one side, uh, um, we have like digital rights and, and there is no link with uh, basic human rights. But uh, for me, this is exactly digital uh, human rights. Uh, so what, what is your perspective on that? If I may just, uh, since I was the last to talk, just chip in and say to me, digital rights are human rights. And in our age, the opposite is also vice versa is also true because our human rights, we have been talking about this, you know, I think it's clear that they, our rights are more and more shaped, uh, mediated, either facilitated or challenged in their full uh, implementation by the digital context in which we live. And to be honest, now there is even, uh, there are already studies on the potential future impact of uh, the metaverse on our human rights, because we are already talking about spending part of our lives in a different virtual dimension. So we can no longer dichotomize these rights. One thing feeds into the other and the other way around. Anna? Yeah, uh, yes, um, I, I, I of course agree. But I, I would like to add that we should not forget that the digitalization of rights make the access to to rights for some group of people more complex and uh, and and the ingos for social social work oriented ngos work a lot on that uh, and see that as well um uh, and and also 
this digitalization and the lack of the face-to-face -face contact with people, you know, the human factors, uh, it's also complexify some issue that, uh, and I, I, I have my hypothesis that it's make the access more, um, more, more difficult because this digitalization defend the interest of the companies of services and not of the client. But uh, this is my hypothesis. However, um, I think that there is also one uh, one question that we found the digitalization should not uh, create the black box system. The people should understand what happened uh, uh, when when they 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 want to claim their rights and they need to know. So the transparency is so much important and even more important when the rights are digitalized um, uh, 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 and mediated, as as Francesca said, by human rights by by the digital technology. So the transparency should be even increased. Uh, and and myself as a citizen, I need to know where is my claim uh, at each stage, and I need to have access to information um, and explanation on that. So I, I I think that this is also the 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 the, the, the dimension of 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 this digitalization of rights and digital rights as well linked to the human rights. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarit. Do you have something to uh, between this? around um, this dichotomy. I'm going to unmute myself. Um, so just in line with, you know, this question about uh, human rights and digital rights and, and the similarities really between them at the end of the day and what Francesca was saying before about how we need, we need to get people to appreciate that their data is important, you know, uh, to them to, to, but so how, how do we get them to understand that digital rights are as important as human rights? How, you know, oftentimes you hear people say, well, I have nothing to hide. So what does it matter if people, what people know about me, uh, you know, what my data says. So how do we get them to appreciate the, the importance of their data, the importance of their digital rights as much as they appreciate human rights? Okay, thank you. I think uh, our time is now over. So thank you, ladies, for this very interesting uh, discussion. I hope the audience uh, has the same, uh, you know, fireworks in their head that that I have in mind, actually. So thank you so much, uh, Marie. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, anyway. Thank you very much to all the panelists. This was um, excellent and uh, I'm, I'm sure the audience enjoyed it very much. So thank you very much, everyone. Our next panel will take place at 1 p.m. So join us again online on YouTube um, um, in an hour. Thank you very much.